5, and then we will look at James chapter number 5, verse number 10 and 11 as we pick up on our study of angelology where we are looking at the offense of angels and the ones that fail, uh, that sinned, and the demon spirits, and then we have been focusing on uh, the chief of the fallen angels called Lucifer, the sa Satan, the destroyer, the deceiver, uh, the rulers we'll look at, at a little later on, but uh, we are looking at him now as the destroyer in the capacity that he's in. First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 7, Peter says, Casting all your care upon him, that is upon Jesus Christ, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. What a solemn warning we have here and how that he inspires us to continue to be on our best behavior, our best look towards heaven and to cast our burdens upon the Lord. It helps us and to cast our care upon him. I'm wondering, as the Holy Ghost just impressed us upon my heart, you remember Peter was in the boat and Mark chapter 4, and they were going to the other side. The storm came up. And remember, the disciples were worried, troubled in heart, vexed in spirit. They went across and they woke the master up. <laughs> and they said, Master, careth not that we perish. Well, Peter's the one who says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I believe he learned a lesson that the master does care. And I believe Peter was taught that night that Jesus does care. And he does care in concern about what we're in and what we're up against. Uh, we are looking at Satan as the destroyer. Uh, here we can actually put that verse to work for us, uh, reminding us that Satan is walking about as a roaring lion, seeking, searching out those whom he may, with one big gulp, destroy. He wants to devour you. One thing Satan does know, among the other things he knows, one of the major things he knows is once a person has been saved by the grace of God, sealed by the Spirit of God, and birthed into the family of God, genuinely saved, you can never be lost. Satan can never take you to hell. Cast your fear away with that. But he can destroy your testimony. At times, he can destroy your body. At times, he can destroy other things. He can destroy your mind. If, great big if, capital letters, God allows him to. And that would be for the purpose, and the purpose only, of God's will being accomplished, which we do not know what, how God operates. His ways are far above our ways. And his ways are far, uh, far finding out. We do not understand why God allows what he does at times. We'll understand it as the song goes in the sweet by and by. Uh, if God sees fit to show us. As a young preacher, I made this statement quite often. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God. I have not made that statement in quite a few years. The reason I have not made that statement is because when I get to heaven, I won't have to ask God anything. I'm going to have the mind of Christ. I'm going to know what God wants me to know. And I'm not going to be concerned with what didn't take place. I'm going to be concerned with hearing him say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Don't understand it down here, but things are going to be a little different when we get there. But getting back to what's at hand, Satan, we've looking at him as Satan's target as a destroyer, your, is your body. We are still waiting for the redemption of the body. Now, we saved. We're completely saved. We, him, we are complete. I'm not talking about stages of getting saved. But there's one thing that has not been completely delivered yet, and that's this body. That will be when we have the glorified body. But until then, thank God, uh, uh, we, we do realize, and according to the word of God, when we do go through the things that we go through and the trials and the tribulations and, and the hurts and the sufferings and the pains we have to go through, unfortunately, we're going to have to put up with that until Jesus comes or until we get another body. 
And so therefore, we find that Satan knows that. And so one of the major targets that Satan has as a destroyer, and there's four different areas that he works with and four different things that we see Satan as he comes against God's children and, and does that. But I want to say to you tonight, we are so thankful that we do know how he operates and how his, what his targets are. And he's not changed his tactics one bit. So when you're tried and you're tested and you're tempted and all these things come, remember where it comes from. One of the major things that we looked at a few weeks ago, how Satan deals with and what Satan does, does uh, do, and one of his major weapons is he tries to, uh, to, to deceive you, and he does that by... Come into your mind and speaking to your mind and dealing with your mind. Uh, I am thankful tonight that there's been many that tried to drag my past up. I go back to South Boston and what have you. I, I had two people to come one night and actually told me the only reason they came to that meeting wasn't really to hear me preach, was to see if it was really so. That the, that the sorry, low-down, good-for-nothing, wicked rascal that I was when I was in high school and in my teenage years and my early part of my 20s to see, to see if it was really so that, that that man had changed so as people had said he had. Well, thank God when they left, Miss Bonnie Good, remember? She came up, she was a Mennonite. She came up to me, she was different in school. I believe she's the same as I am. Uh, she was different in school. I had classes with her. She was sweet as she could be. Whatever. But she came up at night and she looked at me and, and she eyeball to eyeball and got close to my face. And she said, I would have never believed it if I had not heard it with my own ears, seen it with my own eyes. And now I know it's so. God still works miracles. How true that is. But I am what I am by the grace of God. And one of the things that many, when they hear the name Elwood Seamster, that don't know I'm saved or hadn't got, it's probably most of them do now, the ones that are still living and what have you. But there, there was a time uh, when they heard that name and didn't know I was saved. And they didn't think about me being a preacher. As a matter of fact, they'd come up and say, my God, he's the biggest drunk that ever walked. Like that. And he, he's telling me how to live. He's going to tell me what to do. And drags up my past. Well, when they go, when devil goes to Satan with that, when, when he goes to God with that, God says, in essence, now, I, I, I don't know how it actually happens, but this is just my rendering of it. God says, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you, you're talking about that drunk over there. That, they used to lay in his own vomit. That, that, that one over there, you couldn't nobody tell him. That, that one used to cuss every other breath. That one, when you saved him, had to change it, get a brand new vocabulary. God said, I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Because God has promised us in his book that he has cleaned our slate, throw the slate away, made us a new creature in Christ, and he will never. You get this, you get it, and you get it good. One of the major weapons that Satan does is to drag my, in my life, I don't know what he does in yours, is to drag my past up. And to tell me, how can you stand in that pulpit and tell those people, 52 years you've been doing this and preaching uh, as a pastor going on 48 years this year, how can you stand in that pulpit and tell those people that thing when you used to do? I tell him now what God tells him. I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Because God don't know. And if God don't know, I don't give a flip what everybody else says. If God is pleased and God is satisfied, that's all you and I need, honey. I, I ain't got to please no. I know that ain't good English, but I ain't got to please nobody else. God has saved me. God has cleansed me, and God has done that. But one of the targets that Satan still uses, because I am human, and I'll listen to him. God forbid, just like you do. We'll listen to him at times, and when we do, we're going to be defeated. We're going to get discouraged. We're going to get down and out. We're going to get our mind off of heaven. It's exactly what he intended for us to do. If you, can, if you get to victory over that, and you should, and you get victory over that, and you go on and when he does that, just cast it down, plead the blood, and says, thank God for the blood. Thank God I'm a changed creature. Thanks to Calvary, as Brother Mike sings, I don't go there anymore. Thanks to Calvary, I'm not the man I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, things are different than they used to be. Thanks to Calvary, things are not like they used to be before. 
I get that settled and get it. Then he starts to work in another area. He said, I can't get him out. He's got the victory. So what does he do? He starts to work in as a destroyer. And he does what he does. And every one of us here tonight know what it is to feel pain. And when you are in pain, you are not yourself. Well, maybe you are. Maybe that's when we really ourselves. But, but, we're, but when we're in pain, our mind is not on heavenly things. Or it's very easily to get them off the heavenly things. And very easily to get them off of our Lord and to get them on ourselves and get them on our pain and do that. God's designed it that way. If when I cut myself or if I hurt myself and some, I had pain in myself, if, if my brain didn't tell me where I was hurting, I'd be in a mess. And so it's designed that I do hurt. It's designed uh, that this brain, this body tells me where I'm hurting and when I'm hurting. And so therefore the devil knows that. And so he'll go and he'll have to get permission from God to attack the body. And when he does attack that, that have to, as, he, as a destroyer, we see he, he, your body is what he comes after. And his weapon, his weapon is suffering. That's what he uses. Suffering. If you come back to our example, we looked at last week, Job chapter number two, one and chapter number two. We read those two chapters, and we seen where Satan attacked at Job's body. And so he had through everything that God would let him throw at him except take his life. Why? Life is given by God. Life is of God. And it's in you. It's in you to preserve your life. And to try to take care of yourself and protect yourself if your life. That's a God-given life that God's given us. And say Satan knows that. So he said you can do everything, anything you want to do to him. Take everything he has. Now you can start to work on his body. Now you can start working on him so he'll suffer in his body. And Satan said, you let me do that. I guarantee you he'll curse you to your face. He'll do that. He'll curse you if you do that. Well, we know the story, don't we? We read the story, and we read it, and you knew it before I read it. Uh, it backfired on him. Of course, God taught Job some valuable lessons. His three friends taught him some lessons, and he let him go through some things like that. But we see here Job is a prime example of God letting Satan loose on the body uh, and let us to be suffering. And we know that there's natural suffering and there's discipline suffering. We looked at all of that. Now, I come to my point tonight for the next few minutes. I want to spend this, uh, this session on the purpose of that. Now, we know as the destroyer, Satan comes after the body. And then his weapon he uses is suffering, but he has a purpose. And each one of these things that we see him operating, his purpose is to make you impatient with God's will. Now, look at your Bible at James chapter 5, verse number 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets whom has spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of what kind of afflictions? Suffering afflictions and of, uh-oh, look at this word, and of patience. James chapter 5, verse 10, and then verse 11. Behold, when you see that word in the Bible, usually it's a comma after it. But this word behold means exactly what it says, hold it. <laughs> I want you to get this and you hear it. Hold up. Behold, stop, look, listen. Something very important, not that the rest of it ain't, but something with emphasis on the subject is fixing to be, talk, be talked about. We count them happy which endure. You have heard of the what of Job, of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful, and of tender mercy. Now, the word end here doesn't mean that the Lord ends and no more, has no more beginnings. God neither begins or ends. That's not what James is saying here. That little word simply means which he has brought about in his own perfect way. And God brought about in Job's life in his own perfect way the sufferings that Job went through to teach Job a valuable lesson. And Job learned the most valuable lesson in his life that any person in the Old Testament or New has ever learned. That God 
is in total and complete control. Job did not know about the conversation that went on in heaven between Satan and the devil. Uh, Satan, the devil, and God. He didn't know about that conversation. God asked the questions. And God, God says, hast thou considered my servant Job? And we know that he had. But here, that whole thing was to bring about and to show us, not to put emphasis on Job as we use him as an example, but to put emphasis on God being a sovereign and a holy God, that nothing can happen to one of his children except he allow it. And Satan, the powerful creature that he is, cannot do one thing to one of God's children except he, first of all, get permission. That's a blessing to this preacher. Satan has to get permission. You better believe he better get permission because if he didn't have to get permission, I don't think probably any of us would be here tonight. He would have been wiped us out. But thank God, God's got a reason. God's got a reason for leaving us here and doing that. James chapter 5 and verse number 11 indicates that Satan's purpose was to get Job to be impatient and to give up. Question, did Job give up? Oh, he got discouraged. Yes, he did. But he didn't give up. He made the statement, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. I'll continue to believe in him. I'll continue to put my sight on him. And so he didn't. Job did become impatient with himself and impatient with his friends, but he never lost faith in his God. By the way, this, this was a blessing to me. The only time and the only place you will find in the entire New Testament, the 27 books that God gives us called the New Covenant or the New Testament books, the only time you will find Job's name mentioned, not in the Gospels, but in the book of James, and it has to do with patience. And this is the only verse in the New Testament you will find Job mentioned. I thought that was a blessing. But how many times does God have to mention something for it to be true? Once. And that's all God saw fit to mention that. Why? Because he's dealing with patience. So have patience. God tells us what he wants us to know. And that's enough. This Bible does not contain all God knows. It just contains all God wants us to know. And so the patience of Job is seen in the first time he's mentioned in the New Testament. Patient is an important Christian virtue. In order for us to learn many valuable lessons and many valuable truths, we must learn patience. And yes, I'm using the term in the word learn patience. Paul says, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am, thou wilt to be content. And so we ought to learn to be patient and learn to walk with God and to learn that God takes care of that. And nothing can happen to me no matter how tragic it may be in my life or what have you. If I'm God's child, nothing can happen to me except God allow it. And that's according to Romans, to mold me and to make me into the image of his dear son, Jesus Christ, that I'll be more, more like Jesus. That's the reason that we must have that. Now, in order for us to learn many valuable lessons and truths, we've got to learn, learn patience. James chapter 1, verse 2, look at it. James is a tremendous book on this thing of patience. James chapter 1 and verse number 2. My brethren, count it all joy. That's internal peace. When, not if, ye fall into divers many temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So, but let patience have her perfect work, that you be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And so therefore, we are told in the beginning of this book, if you are saved, and James was written to save people, if you are saved, then you are going to endure and you are going to have to put up with and you are going to have in your life times that you are going to have to be patient. Now, your pastor is not a very patient man, but I am patient. Thank God. We better, I, I, all of God's children better think I am patient to a certain degree. 
Uh, and, and I am thankful that you are patient to a certain degree. But that's the reason we will continue to work on that until God takes us home. That shows that I am imperfect uh, in my walk. I am perfect in my position. That will never change. But in my practice, I am imperfect. I know that's hard for some of you to believe. But in my practice, I am imperfect. It's how does God mature me? What does God allow in my life? Trials, tests, things to come that I will be patient in and to teach me patience as I go with him. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 11, Paul had learned those patience. Impatience is a mark of immaturity. And so therefore, every one of us to one uh, aspect of our life and our walk with God, every one of us are Im immature to a certain extent. We are not completely, fully developed and grown and fully matured. When will, we have, when will we get to that place? When we get to glorified body. And so we got something to work on and something that we can be with until we get to glory. Have you ever met anybody that knows it all? You, you, you cannot tell them anything about any given subject. I never want to get to that way in my life. I, I don't care how deep we get in this book, how, how, how much we may think we know about this book, there's always room to learn and mature. And that's the reason when we first get saved, God does not give us the meat of the word. Right all at one time. We cannot handle it. No way we could. There's some things now it's hard for me to handle. It handles me. And as one dear friend of mine said, may God help us when we look at the word of God and not say we are handling the word of God, but may the word of God handle us. And it does. It handles us in the way that we need to be. Uh, and I'm not saying that you're stupid, and I'm not saying that you're dumb, and I'm not saying that you're immature, but we've always got room to improve in any given area of our life. I'm still learning at 76 years old, be 77, June the 30th. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm still learning right now in my life. I am still learning some things that I didn't know too much about coming up and what have you. And some material things and some uh, electronics. I am dumb when it comes to electronics. But I am learning. Now I can not only turn my computer on, I know how to turn it off. <laughs> and so I'm learning different things and aspects. That automobile that I drive, it's got stuff on it I have not used yet and probably will never use. Why? I don't know. I don't know how to use it. I don't know what it's talking about. I mean, it's got apps on it. It's got this on it. It's got that. Going down the road, a bell will ring. And I think, I think they're calling me to dinner. And it says, check your oil. It's time to change oil. I mean, it, that guy told me, I said, when do I need to bring this in for service? He said, don't worry about it. It'll tell you. And it, not, not only, it, it will literally tell you when it's time to get something done. The tire pressure can get two pounds below or one pound below what they recommend the tire pressure on it. It'll be a little blinking light. Come, your tire, check your tires at your earliest convenience. It will do that. I mean, really, it's, it's called a smart car. Why, am you, why are you saying all of that? God uses that automobile, the materialistic things of this world, to teach me patience. I had an automobile one time. I went out there to crank it. The coldest day of the year we had. Snow was on the ground. I was going to turn it around and let the, let the snow melt off of it. And pack it out the thing. And I went to hit the key. And son, it didn't turn over. The battery was dead. Well, I raised the hood. I looked on the right. No battery. I looked on the left. No battery. I looked in the front. No bad. I looked at everywhere possibly conceivable for a man's brain that a battery should be under the hood of an automobile. Every car had up there, then that's where the battery was at. I said, ah, I bet it's in the trunk. I, that's where it's in, this one's in the trunk. I know now where batteries are. But anyway, I, I, I looked in the trunk. I raised it up, nothing but a spare tire, no battery. I told Diane, I said, Diane, this car doesn't have a battery. She said, it's got to have a battery. 
I said, I thought so too, but uh, maybe it's something I don't know. I, I said, it's no battery. Now, I'm, I'm using this to, to show you something. My sweet, dear, loving wife looked at me, and she says, why don't you look in the manual? You know what that is? That's the book that comes with every automobile, telling you about every part on it, telling you where everything's at on it, what you need to do. Sister, I looked it up, and you know where that battery was in that automobile? Of all places, it was under the back seat. You literally had to take the back seat out to put the battery in to do that. What do you say? Why'd you tell us that story? I learned something that day. Poor ignorant me. Didn't know where the battery. Now, I can tell you right now, if you've got a 2001 Cadillac, I can tell you where the battery's at. It's under the back seat. Every automobile, every truck I get now, everything I got, First thing I do, not the first thing, but immediately after I get it, I look at the manual. I look at why. It's giving me instructions. It's so things that I'm dumb in and the areas I'm dumb in that will it enlighten me. I'll know what to do. I won't be so stupid in that thing to do. I won't have to. I said, this is where it's at. We need to take care of this. I, <laughs> I, I, I've got the manual. You, you, you've got the manual. So why? So we won't be so stupid. So we won't be so dumb. So we won't know. Well, when we got questions about where the battery's at that operates this thing, we'll know where it's at. God will tell us which area we need to deal on. What does God tell us when he sends trials and night? To teach us patience. And so we learn patience. And the devil knows that. And he knows most of us are impatient. So therefore, God, uh, Satan's purpose is to make you impatient with, of all things, God's will. A man that knows he's saved, it's hard to do anything with him. A man that knows God's will, you are not going to do anything with him. Dr. Bell used to tell us, you show me a man that knows he's called to preach, I'll show you a man, praise God, that'll stand his ground and thunder forth the truth. You show me a man that thinks he's called to preach, he won't make it six months in the ministry. You got to know. You got to know. That's how I know I'm saved. That's when I thunder from this pulpit. You can know you're saved. Why? Because this Bible tells you that you can do that. If you don't get that settled, that's one of the first things you have to do in your Christian life is to get that settled. You are imperfect. You're going to foul up. You, 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 you are going to do things that you wish to God you hadn't done, say things you wish you hadn't done, but you'll not continue on that path if you're saved by the grace of God. And God will allow that thing and get you right with God, and then you'll make another step and you'll continue walking down that path. You'll run into something else, and then you'll ask God, why, what you want me to learn out of this? Continue to do that. So we, we, he, the devil knows if he can get us to get our hands off of God and get our eyes off of God. Impatience is a mark of immaturity. Impatience is a mark of unbelief. Boy, that hurts, doesn't it? When I'm impatient with the things of God and asking God to do something, I get impatient because God is not answering on my time schedule and not acting according to like I think he ought to be acting, then I get impatient. And what does that do? Well, that's just impatience. It's a mark of unbelief. If I believe God, that's what that statement means when that centurion said, Lord, I believe, help mine unbelief. I say that all the time. I believe, help mine unbelief. Because there's things and areas in my life and things and areas in your life that we do not have the faith that we should have in that particular area. And so therefore we can get impatient in that particular area unless God begins to unfold and help us and help us to grow in that area. And so when you, you and yourself, you become restless and nervous and anxious to do something, you can't rest, you be assured you will not trust in God to work. And Satan's well aware of this and he'll come on the scene. That's when he'll come at you. When you begin to complain and remember, you're a good target for Satan to sit on your shoulder. And boy, he's trained and well-versed in what to say and when to say it and how to say it. Here's one of the favorite tricks he does in my life. I don't know what he does in yours. I'm giving you a personal experience, personal, personal illustration. One of the things he does in my life, <laughs> where's your God now? If, you, if, God, if your God was really the powerful God that you say he is and you preach he is, why would he let you be going through this right now? If your God is such a healer as you say he can heal if he wants to do that, how come he ain't healing you? You ever have those questions? 
If, if your God's so good about, about supplying your every need and everything, then why, how, how, how come your need ain't supplied? Here's a favorite trick of Satan. I've been there and read, I'm not fussing and I'm not doing, I don't know. I'm just telling you, I'm throwing it out there. This is a shotgun explosion. <laughs> I'm throwing it out there. One of the first things that I learned as a young Christian was to put God first in my tithes. Now, if you don't tithe, you don't have no right to ask God for anything. You hear me? And one of the first tricks that Satan does, how many of you tonight are old enough to remember this? Some of you may not even remember this, but I'm an old man, so I remember it. How many of you remember the era of recap tires? Oh, yeah, I thought I had a church full of old people. <laughs> but but, but I, I used to run recap tires on a 55 Ford I had, 56 Ford I had. 59 Ford, I, I, that's all around was recap tires. One of the reasons my uncle was the head of a recapping place there in Gretna, Virginia. And he let me have them for wholesale. Sometimes he wouldn't give them to me. So that's the reason I run recap tires. But I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> They're not what they claim to be. <laughs> they got the job done for a few miles. And they, they did. But, but anyway, let me get back to my story. I had to have, right after I got saved, I had two cap recaps that come off. Not one, two. One on the front and one on the back. They come loose. So I called them and I said, well, I got to have. Well, it was going to cost me $12 and a half for two tires. It was going to break me. That's been many years ago. Matter of fact, I've been saved going on 52 years. So that's been 50, 50 years ago, 51 years ago. And so what I did, I worked 40 hours a week and sometimes 50 and 60 hours a week. Top pay that I would bring home, top pay with a 50-hour week was sometimes we'd get $61. Setting the world on fire. Getting rich quick. Well, I had three children. I had bills. I had doctors, all, all this stuff. Dad was sitting on my face. He said, you need them tires. You got, here's, here's my reasoning. I got to go to work. Well, I do. I got to have. I got to go to work, and so what I did, uh, I just had learned about ta ta the first day, first time I went to church. They had them little envelopes passing around. I didn't know what a tithe was. I didn't know it meant ten percent. I, I didn't have a clue what it was. Gene Ridgeway told me what tithing was all about, and he he looked over and he he caught we we were good buddies before we got saved and all this stuff. He looked over and whispered me. He said he said this this is the tithe. This is the offering. He said that's that's what you made this week. You ten percent that. Then you put a little offering with it. He said, that's what I do. And he said, that's what the Bible teaches. I said, oh, well, I want to do that. So my first time, I put $12, in, $10, and I think it was. I put that in there. Done it every week for two or three weeks. But I hadn't been saved by, by not even a month when that happened. First thing I'd done, the devil said, you can't afford, don't write that time check out. You pay for them tires. You got to go. You skip that. God loves you. He'll understand. I did. I, I was justified to what I'd done. Man, I, 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 I didn't feel bad about not doing it. I said, man, i got to feed my family and i got to go to work, what have you. So I'm just going to leave God out of it this week. I didn't come here and say that verbally, but that's, that was my reason, that was my thing. So I let it go. Three weeks went by. I had it made, didn't give God a thought about times. Well, time the next week, time that. Just didn't do it that week. Guess what happened? I got the flu. When you got the flu... Most times, you got in a sense, you don't work. You know how much I, I didn't lose one week. What was it? Two weeks, I believe. I lost two weeks of work. Didn't even get a check for two weeks. What have you. You know what my mind went back to? Now, God didn't, God, God didn't bring it up and put this on me, but my mind went back to them two tires. And here's what the Holy Ghost said. Was it worth it? And I learned a lesson, Brother Perry. That's been 51 years ago. And when God got me straight with him, and I got caught up with him, and I got things squared away with him, and it's not been a week since then, whether that's the first thing that comes. Whether I get $100 a week, $50 a week, or $5,000, or whatever I get, he gets the first fruits. 
of my income. I get a settlement, he gets the first fruit of that. I, I, get, I get insurance, he gets the first fruit of that. I get taxes back. And I had, I had a lady tell, well, she ain't a lady, bless God. But I had a woman to tell me one time, she said, I don't have to tithe now on my, on my Social Security. She said, because I tithe when I was coming up, and that's my money I put in there, so I don't have to tithe on that. Well, you idiot. What do you do with the raises you get? What do you do with the stuff they put in all of that stuff? What is that? I'd hate to think I had God put in a little bottle, put over in the corner like that and says, now I don't have to give you anything because I didn't give you enough when I was coming up and working on my job. If you're that dumb, you need to starve. That's enough of that. But anyway, I learned my lesson. And that's Ben. You can check with Tammy. She's a treasure. You can check with that. I haven't tithed in 50 years. I thought you said you tithe. I ain't. I have not tithed in 50 years. New Testament teaches God loveth a cheerful giver. And the New Testament teaches us that thank God we are to give God the first fruits of what he gives to us. We don't hold it back. We give it to God. And God takes care of that. And I've tried to do that. And I have given over 20, I think it last, my tithes last year was 35% of my income. Not 10%. Over 35%. And Tammy looked at me. She said, Daddy, I don't know how you do it. I said, I don't believe it's God. But when God tells you and you keep him first, and I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. I'm preaching to you a gospel that works. I'm preaching to you, thank God, when you put God where God's supposed to be. And when you do what God tells you to do, and you keep God first in your place, thank God God has promised that he would supply your every need. If you've got a need tonight, the first thing I'd do is get on my knees. I'd cry out to God, God, are you where you're supposed to be in my life? Am I caught up to where I'm supposed to be with you? Am I putting you in first place? Am I doing what you tell me to do? And if all of that is yes, then thank God, hallelujah. I promise you, on the authority of God's word, you will not starve. You may not eat steak, but you won't starve. I don't know how all that got in there, but that's it. I tell you, had got the devil, he'll do everything he can to tell you, now you can't trust God with this. You can't trust, now, now you can't do, this is not even logical. This is not, how are you going to make this? How are you going to do this? You put God first and hide and watch, and you see what God does. Oh, I don't know why, honey, but ever since I've been in Bible college, I always think God's going to bless me. And the only place God can bless me, Miss Tracy, is in the mailbox. And I think one of the reasons is that when I was in Bible college, I was broke. I mean, I had three kids in, in Christian school. I was going to Bible college. I was working uh, eight and ten hours a day and going to school all night and staying up the rest of the night studying. I mean, it was three and a half years. It was pure hell. I'll just tell you it was. But my mama, my dear old mama, she, every month she would send us money in the mail. And I got used to going to that mailbox and looking. And she would, I, I'd open that up and, and, and we'd open that mailbox up and she would send us money. We'd go to the grocery store. Do you know how much groceries you could get for $100 back then? We filled the car up, didn't we? The trunk, the back seat. I ain't got Wheaties. But now I think, and I go to the mailbox. And I think that's the way God's going to bless me. Well, he does a whole lot of times. But I don't have to go to the mailbox now. Why? Thank God my mailbox is in heaven. And my mailbox is in, the, in my heart. And we do what God tells I guarantee you, I promise you as your pastor and as a man of God tonight and as a Christian, you cannot outgive God. When you put God where God's supposed to be and keep God where God requires you to keep him, you cannot do him. Don't you cut God out of your plans. I'm never against anybody going on vacation. You need to come apart before you come apart. I don't know how some of you go as much as you do, but more power to you. I, I, I have never, I have never, never begrudged that. Never. Thank God you need to come apart. You need to do that. Just don't go visit another church. I'll come after you. Uh, but but, but, but you, go, you go on a vacation. You, you come apart before you come apart. I'm not against that. But don't you take God's money and do that. Amen. Let's go. I need to go. I get. I need to get off of that now. And I got. That's my hoppy horse. I done rode it long enough. I don't guess it's a hoppy horse. You, you agree with what I said? Amen. We'll see Sunday. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip. And by the way, let me say this while I got it on my heart. Thank you, Calvary Baptist Church. 
Thank every one of you here tonight that give. Thank you for minding God and do that. God, God has kept this church where it's supposed to be. God has taken care. We're not in the red. We're not poor mouthing. God takes care of this church. God helps us. And I believe God's going to take care of every dime of this roof. I believe he'll do that. I believe he's going to do that. By faith, I believe God's going to do that. God's helping us. And I appreciate every dime that you have given. I'll say it again Sunday morning. I appreciate everything that you've given, every dime that you've given towards it, every sacrifice you've made. I don't take it and belittle that one bit. I know it's a sacrifice for some, and I know it, but I praise God and thank you tonight for minding God and just doing what God says. And God may give it back to you before the sun comes up, and he may not, but you ain't giving it to be prosperous. You're giving it to be obedient. Amen? Amen. So faith and patience inherit the promises. Faith and patience go together. We ought to be, as Hebrews chapter 6 and chapter 12, uh, chapter 6 and verse 12 tells us, be followers, imitators of them through faith and patience who inherit the promises. And so they go together. Impatience is not only a mark of, of immaturity, unbelief, but it's also a mark of fleshly living, fleshly nature. Always impatient. That's not fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience. By nature, we are impatient. So we need to be controlled by the Spirit of God and led by the Spirit of God and go with God as He sees us. A believer is impatient. You can be reasonably sure he or she is walking in the flesh and not in the Spirit. That lets me know a whole lot of times we're in the flesh. We're impatient. One of the things God uses in this day, this modern age, to teach me patience is old people driving. I'll leave that word set. Impatience will lead you to costly mistakes. I'll say this hurriedly and I'll be done. Example. You remember Abraham got impatient when God had given him a son a promise and told him that he was going to have a son? Isaac, you know, was going to be born. What happened to Abraham? They got impatient. Sarah got impatient, and Abraham hearkened unto Sarah, and he got in a mess. Abraham ain't the only one that's hearkened unto women. He got in a mess. But anyway, he hearkened unto Sarah, and he got into a mess. You know who was born because of impatience? Ishmael. Look at Iran. Look, over, look at all that stuff going on. That, that was 4,000 years ago. And it's still causing havoc and hell in this world because of impatience, because of that generation. Abraham became impatient, and as a result, Ishmael was born, who caused nothing but trouble. He waited, had to wait 14 more years. And then Isaac was born, which brought blessings and joy to him. Another indication illustration. Peter in the garden of Gethsemane cut Malachi's ear off. Need I say any more? He won't go in for Malachi's ear. He was impatient. He was going for his throat, his head. And because of that, Jesus got him out of trouble by sticking Malachi's ear back on. Somebody says that he put the original ear back or he create. Who cares a flip? He could hear. Satan knows if he can get us to become impatient, he can lead us to do something stupid and get ourselves and others into trouble. Satan tempts us to bring out the worst in us, but God permits us to be tempted to go through what we go through to bring out the best in us. You remember Job said in 23.10, he knoweth the way I take. You don't learn patience by reading a book. You don't learn patience by hearing a sermon. The only way that you learn patience is going through the trials that God assigned you. I wish I had something better to tell you, but that's the only way that you're going to learn patience. The Bible teaches this, and we see that every man of God in the Word of God and every child of God that was patient had to go through the trials and tribulation and the test to pass that test. Trials are God's tools to mature us, to build our faith, to get us to trust in the Spirit instead of the flesh. And when you find yourself impatient, you can be sure Satan and the flesh are at work and you are in a danger of making the wrong decisions. When circumstances of life are irritating you, beware. Give you this and I'm done. When family problems come, beware. 
When friends' problems come, beware. When financial problems come, beware. When feelings you wear on your shoulders come, beware. When we are making life uncomfortable, when these family members and friends and finances and feelings making us uncomfortable, then you can be sure Satan is in the corner waiting for an opportunity to attack. That's his purpose as to destroy you. But thank God we have a defense. And I'll look at that next week. It's the imparted grace of God. Hallelujah. Father, thank you tonight for this opportunity we've had once again to share these few words to your dear people. I thank you for sealing them with our hearts and helping us. And Lord, we thank you tonight for taking care of this church, watching over us and helping us. I ask you to be with every individual here, supply their every need, take care of them. God, help us as we mature and walk with thee and learn thy word to know that you're in complete control. We know tonight Satan wants to destroy us, but he can't touch us except you allow it. And if you allow it, your grace will be sufficient. This offer we're about to receive, use it for your glory. We'll praise you in advance for that. In Jesus' bloodstained name, amen.